Mm, good morning and happy Saturday. Uh, Jesse here with the Humble Fungus, a uh, full service mushroom farm uh, here in Lafayette, Colorado. And uh, you support us on Patreon, please, <laughs> so we can uh, make money and pay rent and keep doing this. Um, I want to do a super quick follow up yesterday. I posted a couple of tutorials on how to make mono tubs and take care of your mushrooms at home. Uh, humidity domes, RH, things like that. But what I wanted to cover super quick today is pinning and fruiting conditions. So let's pause for a second and let's go back to what we built yesterday. Yesterday, we built a mono tub. What this is, is a clear plastic tote that we have drilled one, two, three, four, and then five, five, six holes, right? Two on the broad side, one each on the long side. These holes were all around the same level. Doesn't really matter. And then we made a custom liner from a garbage bag that will uh, keep contamination out. And we just threw the lid on it. Done, right? So yesterday I talked a lot about oxygen and CO2. Let's break this down real fast, right? In a tub without any holes, a fungus would colonize your substrate in your liner and emit CO2, right? So the fungus is actually emitting carbon dioxide. Now, this is because fungi breathe in oxygen and exhale CO2 like humans, right? So what does this mean? It means that in a typical forest floor scenario, when a fungus first starts uh, putting out fruiting bodies, they're going to hit a high CO2 environment first. Why? Well, let's look at the forest floor for a moment. If you're a fungus and you're in the earth, the ground, Let's assume that this is the top of the soil in the forest floor. This is soil, which is really a mixture of dead leaves, dead sticks, rocks, things like that, right, waste. Above this, right, and you've got trees, and they're putting their roots down into here, etc. But above this layer, there's another layer. What is this layer in between the soil and the sky? This is dead shit. Dead shit. What's in this layer? Leaves, dog poop, uh, mulch, organics, etc. That's all in this layer right here above the soil. So when a fungus starts to fruit, it creates something called pins. Pins are tiny baby mushrooms. So let's erase this real fast and zoom in. Okay, so this is the forest floor. This is the soil. So soil is down here. Oxygen is up here, and there's a waste layer that kind of looks like this. Now I'm separating these two to show you the way the fungus actually works. So when you see a mushroom, that is actually just the fruiting body of the fungus. It's not the living creature. The living creature is that giant white mass in the soil. So let's call this the fungus right? And these can stretch many, many, many miles, right? A fungus, a single fungus supporting a forest can stretch upwards of hundreds of miles across, right? So here's the fungus. Here's the top of the soil, right? And here's a bunch of dead crap. So when a fungus starts to fruit, it puts out baby mushrooms called pins. See these? Call these pins, those little spikes. What is the environment these pins are now in? 
This has a couple of attributes. Number one, it is high in nitrogen. It is extremely high in nitrogen because these are leaves on organics and things like that. That's number one. Number two, it is extremely high in carbon dioxide because as these decay, they actually emit carbon dioxide and everything else like that. As the fungus is working, it is emitting carbon dioxide. So everything in this pinning environment is extremely high CO2, right? So what did we learn? High CO2 environments are where fungi really enjoy putting out pins, right? Baby mushrooms. So it's high CO2 and it's also high humidity. Right, this is moist, this is moist, right? So this is probably at 80 to 95% RH, right? So this is high humidity, high CO2. The fungus is gonna love this and it's gonna put out pins. And eventually these pins climb above this waist and you get a mushroom, right? Now. What did the mushroom do to do this, right? So the pins start in high CO2. The fungus detects via its hyphae that it is in a high CO2 environment. So it knows through many, many hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that a high CO2 environment is not conducive for the fungus to actually spread its spores. So what does it do? It detects that there's a high CO2 environment and then it says, make more stem, right? Why? Because the stem is what separates the spores, which are located here in the cap, usually, separates the spores from uh, the high CO2 low ground environment. In other words, if it were to spread its spores right here, they wouldn't go anywhere, right? They just fall, right? Here, they're gonna be caught up by the wind and blown all over the place, right? So what does this tell you? So what this tells you is to maximize pinning, you want high CO2, you want high humidity or RH, you want it dark, Okay, that's good. Let's go back to the tub. All right, we got our six holes on the tub. If we covered these holes and we just let the fungus grow, this would fill with CO2 and the fungus would die, right? Because there's no oxygen for it to take it. Right, if we just left it sealed. Uh, if we make holes and we put micropore tape over them, then the fungus can actually exchange CO2 for air. Great, right? But how do you know if you're in trouble or how do you maximize your pin set? So let's say you've made your mono tub and you put your substrate here in the bottom. You've got your liner, right? Your substrate is in here and you've mixed your spawn. So, how do you get increased pins, right? You've got holes, it can breathe, you fixed it, it's not gonna build up CO2, but you want some high CO2 in this case, right? That's easy. Leave it closed, right? Because even with the filter patches, this is gonna be a high CO2 environment. You're not actually transferring enough oxygen and CO2 via these filter patches or these filter holes to dramatically affect the growing of the pin set. But if you're worried about maximizing it, you can do something really easy. Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap is sterile. And it's got these nice little voids and things like that. What do you think those help with? Well, if we're simulating the forest floor, And we put this bubble wrap, bubble side down, on top of our substrate in our tub. What this does is it creates this nice microclimate 
that maintains humidity and keeps in CO2. So what you do is after you put everything in the tub, you take this bubble wrap and put it over the top and then you watch for pins. As soon as you see the pins, you pull this off and you give them all the ex uh, oxygen, right? So how can you tell if your mushrooms need more oxygen? This is what happens when a mushroom is called leggy, right? So if we look at a mushroom, you've got your cap, or you've got your stem and you've got your cap, right? So the longer the stem, the more desperate for oxygen the mushroom is. In other words, if you have a stem that's 12 inches long and a cap that's one inch wide, that is a leggy mushroom. It's a tiny cap to a huge stem. It's not a king oyster, right? Um, so what do you do? Well, if you see nothing but stem on your mushrooms, they need more, they need more oxygen. So you can take the lid off, you can fan them more, you can flip the lid, you can take the lid off, anything you want. The point is, is that if you get too much stem, that's too much CO2. And the mushroom will actually grow in your tub to raise itself above the CO2. So let's say there's a bunch of CO2 trapped down here. The fungus will actually put out the stem and it will keep climbing until it escapes the CO2 layer. And then it will make a cap and spread its spores. So basically what we've just covered is the natural uh, environment that these pins form in and how you can tell if your mushrooms are starving for oxygen. It's actually pretty simple. If your stems are super long, they need more air. If they're super short and stubby, then they probably need more CO2, right? It's a balance. Anyways, I hope that helps.